Hi, this is Eric White. This is the second screencast in a series of screencasts in which I'm going to teach you how to write recursive pure functional transformations. There are a lot of types of programming problems, but functional programming is most applicable to one particular type of programming problem, and that is the programming problem of transformations. In the first screencast in this series, I talked about a number of different varieties of transformations. For instance, I talked about transforming word processing ML to HTML. Another example that I mentioned is transforming a document to another document that has no tracked revisions in the document. For instance, the start of the transformation is a word processing document that has tracked revisions in the document, and the end of the transformation is a new word processing document that has no tracked revisions. Another example of an interesting transformation is taking an HTML document that is styled with cascading style sheets and transforming that to word processing ML. That's a fairly complex transformation that involves writing a CSS processor. All of these types of transformations are best written using recursive pure functional transformations. And in order to get to our destination, which is to teach you how to write these recursive pure functional transformations, I need to cover some basic ground first. Recursive transformations are a somewhat advanced technique, but this is really what we're interested in as OpenXML developers. This screencast series is directly addressed to competent object-oriented developers who need to come up to speed on functional programming. C Sharp 3.0 has been out for quite a few years now, and C Sharp 3.0 is a language that has functional programming constructs built right into the language. So given that I am orienting this screencast series to a competent object-oriented developer, it's worthwhile to compare functional programming and recursive pure functional transformations to object-oriented programming. This can give you a bit of context to see what the differences are and what's the same between the two styles of development. You really do think about solving problems in a different way when you do functional programming or when you write recursive pure functional transformations. You have to put on a different style of thinking cap to approach your problems, and that's part of what I'm going to explain in this series. But first, let's just take a look at some of the main differences between object-oriented programming and functional programming. So when you do object-oriented programming, what do you really do? Well, the first thing you do is you sit down and you design your classes, and you design class hierarchies. In those classes, you define methods, fields, properties, and events in some cases. The fields and properties comprise state in your class, so you might define a set of valid states for an object of that class. You might define valid pre- and post-conditions for methods in that class. These are the types of activities that you do when you set about to build a software system using object-oriented programming techniques. So what do you do when you do functional programming? What you do is you define transformations. You might define a transformation of a collection to a new collection using a variety of operations. Sometimes these operations are called operators, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. You might define a transformation that is a transform of a collection to a singleton. This might be a process such as summing, or averaging, or concatenation, or even doing some more sophisticated type of processing where you're rolling up values into a single value. An example of this is, in OpenXML, a style can be based on another style, and that style can be based on another style. So what you do then, if you want to assemble all of the styling information for a particular style, is that you create a list of all the styles, and then you start at the 
most base style in that list, you set the styling information into some data structure, then you proceed on to higher and higher priority styles. With each higher priority style, you overwrite styling in your aggregation of the styling information. And when you get to the bottom of the list, you have all the styling information for that particular style. And then you can apply that styling information to the paragraph that you need to apply it to. Defining a transformation means that you are going to be using operators on these collections. And so what are these operators? Let's take a few of them and examine them in detail. The first is that of projection. One point about operators when we're talking about functional programming we call them operators, but you know what? They're not really operators. They're just methods. They're functions. We call them operators because they are these methods that operate on an entire collection. They have a particular semantic behavior over an entire collection. So we say that they operate on that collection. So we call them operators. But we have to make a distinction between these types of operators and the standard types of operators that you run into in C sharp and JavaScript, which are the binary operators plus minus times divide or unary operators such as the negation operator. These are really just methods. So here let's look at this little C sharp program. Now the first line of this program where it declares a variable source and it initializes that variable source to an array of integers and the contents of that array of integers are 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9. If you're not familiar with this shorthand for initializing an array of integers, don't worry about that too much. This is just standard C-sharp shorthand. It doesn't technically have anything to do with functional programming. It's just a very convenient way to declare an array and to initialize that array to a set of values. Is this next line here that we're interested in. This line where it takes the variable source and it dots into this method select. The select method is the projection method in C sharp. And what this projection method does is it takes a lambda expression as an argument and this lambda expression has a single argument into the lambda expression, this argument i, and it returns i times 2. This call into the select method is going to return a new collection where every item in the collection has been multiplied by 2. And at the end of this what the code does is it calls to array just because to print out these values, it's a whole lot easier if we get them in the form of an array. And then finally down here at the bottom, this for loop prints every item in the resulting collection after doing the projection. So if we run this example, sure enough, we see that it outputs a list of integers where every integer in the resulting collection is equal to two times the particular item in the source collection. One point about this lambda expression right here is got this funny equal greater than syntax. Lambda expressions are really simple. All they are are just a method. That's all they are. They're a method that takes a certain number of arguments and it returns a particular value. There are a few varieties of syntaxes that you can use for these lambda expressions. We'll cover these in the next screencast when I talk about lambda expressions in detail. But suffice it to say that lambda expressions are really simple. All they are are a function or a method. One more interesting thing about this particular case is these methods don't have a name. Because they don't have a name, they're called an anonymous method and they are declared right there as an argument to that method select. The advantage of defining the method right there as an argument to the select call is that we don't need to look elsewhere to see what that method does. So for instance, if we were passing in 
the name of a not anonymous method, the name of a named method, then we would have to go find that named method elsewhere in the source file to see what that method actually did. So that's the advantage of having this method here that is an anonymous method called directly as an expression as an argument to the select extension method. Now, just to show you this isn't unique to C Sharp, let's take a look at the exact same program in JavaScript. As an aside, this is using the very excellent link.js module that you can find on CodePlex. You can find this open source project at link.js.codeplex.com. This link.js enables you to use syntax that is very much like link in your JavaScript programs. So here we can see where I've defined the source array that contains the same set of integers. When using link.js, one of the important things is that you actually have to convert an array to a variable of type enumerable, and that's what this enumerable.from does. We pass the source array into the enumerable.from method, and that returns an enumerable. We can then dot into the select method. And within that select method, we can see the anonymous function. Now, the syntax in JavaScript is slightly different. Instead of using i arrow and then return the value, it uses function parenthesis i bracket and then it returns the value. So it's a very minor difference in syntax, but it's basically the exact same thing. It's an anonymous function that is declared in context as an argument to the select method. And finally, this example also calls to array because it's easier to work with arrays when we're dumping out the results of this projection. And if I run this example, it opens up Internet Explorer and prints out the exact same sets of values. So you can see we were able to do a projection in C-sharp and then using an almost identical syntax, also do projection in JavaScript. Throughout this screencast series, all along, I'm going to show examples both in C-sharp and JavaScript. For one thing, you can do everything in JavaScript that you can do in C-sharp. And for another thing is, I really believe that implementations in JavaScript are going to be extremely popular in a very short amount of time. There are a lot of use scenarios for JavaScript that are not as easy to accomplish in C Sharp. Therefore, I'm going to be presenting just about every example that I present, both in C Sharp and in JavaScript. So now we've taken a look at projection. The next thing that we want to look at is filtering. Let's go back to our little example program. And instead of calling select, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to where. And I'm going to where. And I'm going to modify it such that it, it returns true or false based on whether the item in the collection is greater than or equal to 4. And let's run this example. And sure enough, we can see the resulting collection. It has fewer members because we filtered it. And it contains the integers 4, 5, and 9. And let's look at the same modification to JavaScript. So now let's run the JavaScript version. And we get the exact same results. Of course, these are little toy examples. In the real world, you'll be combining a lot of these into the same query. You'll take some collection, you'll filter it, you'll project, you'll do something else, you'll sort it, and so on and so forth. You might actually then take some other data source and do filtering, projection, sorting, whatever you need to do. And then you may take the results of those two transforms or those two queries and combine them into a whole nother query 
where we project, sort, filter, do whatever we need to do. The key point is right now we're looking at very basic operations, but later on we're going to see how to combine these operations into more and more elaborate scenarios. This is the end of this screencast. In the next screencast, we'll examine the sorting, grouping, and aggregation operators.